Honored to have you join us today for the third week of our series, The Upside Down Kingdom. I want to encourage you that uh, comment. Uh, if you're watching on one of our social media platforms, comment on it. Whether you're watching it live, um, on the premiere, or if you're watching it on demand, comment on it. Let's interact. Let's have a little bit of community with this. And as always, if God's speaking something to you, I want to encourage you, share it. Let's, let's let people know what Jesus is doing. Amen. So let's go, Lord, in prayer, and we're going to jump right in. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you care for us. Thank you that you see all that is going on in our hearts and in our lives. Father, I pray, God, for just the next couple of minutes that you would anoint my words, my thoughts. Let them be for your people. Lord, let us meet with you in a very real way. Lord, I pray that your words would find fertile soil. Let people grow and respond and be more of what you want them to be. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. So we started this series by talking about the fact that God's kingdom has a certain set of spiritual laws that guide how God moves and works. And he's made those laws known to us. It's difficult for us to comprehend because they, they don't operate in a manner that comes naturally to us. The one we're going to look at today is just simply the idea that the first shall be last. The first shall be last. And so, it, again, that doesn't make sense because from a human perspective, the kingdom of God is an upside-down kingdom. That's why we call it that. But we get that from the idea, idea of Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So we talked about last week, the whole idea, lose your life to save it. Today we're going to talk about first shall be last. In weeks to come, we're going to talk about give to receive, and that there's joy in suffering. Love those who hate you, and that we're strongest when we're weak, and really kind of wrapping our mind around some of these ideas. One of the stories in which our human perspective is really flipped up, upside down is found in the book of Mark, chapter 9 where Jesus defines what it means to be great in the kingdom of God. Listen to this, Mark 9, 33 and 34. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? Now, I want to stop there real quick because you know Jesus knew what they were talking about. But I love how he does it. What were you guys talking about? Verse 34, but they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. So let's, let's kind of unpack that for just a minute. Jesus returns to Capernaum, verse 33, where his great Galilean ministry had begun all the way back in Mark 1, 21, and where his headquarters in Galilee had been located. This time he didn't linger there long since his public ministry in the region had already ended. He'd moved on. Okay, he instructed his disciples in the house. Why is that important? Because he says, he says, you'll notice, when he was in the house, he asked them why. Because it was private. It was a private moment. He didn't do it out publicly in front of everybody. It was a one-on-one. -on -one. It was a training time. The house is probably the one belonging to Andrew or Peter, okay? But he, he's training and he's instructing them. And the instruction really goes from verse 33 all the way to verse 50. But let's be real. The disciples were probably a little embarrassed and a lot ashamed of their arguing among themselves about who would be the greatest in verse 34. Because Jesus' question about it, what did it get from them? Silence. It got crickets. They were like... They knew they were busted, right? And, well, my, you know, they, they might have been a little ashamed in that process. But instead of contemplating Jesus' passion and, and the suffering it would involve for both him and them, they had been occupied with senseless arguments about greatness. Since questions of this sort were common among the Jews of the day, the disciples' dispute shows how much they were really influenced by the culture of that time. They still did not understand what the Messiah came to do. The people of that day wanted and they believed a Messiah who would deliver them from Roman occupation and set up Israel as an earthly kingdom again. Now, most of you know that I am an avid Dallas Cowboys fan, okay? And I can remember back in the Super Bowl run of the 90s that they had a six foot three, 325 pound monster named Larry Allen on the offensive line. Larry Allen was actually known as one of the strongest men to ever play the game. No lie. He set a record on bench press where he benched 705 pounds. 705 pounds at bench press. And he could squat 905 pounds. Absolutely mind-blowing. Israel was expecting the Messiah to look like a Larry Allen type that would come in and just destroy Rome. And that's not at all what Jesus was doing. See, we often look at these type of scriptures and we quickly read them and think, Pfft, those silly disciples. And honestly, I think a lot of times the disciples really get kind of a bad rap. Some of it's very well deserved. But if I'm completely honest, I have to admit that I struggle with this at times. 
I may not say it in these words, okay? But honestly, and, and again, it's a little embarrassing to say, but I would like to be known as the greatest of something. I would like to be known as, as the greatest husband or the greatest dad. I, I would love to be known as, as the greatest pastor. You know, I already pastor the greatest church. I want people to, to, to you know, those ideas. I, I'm, again, I might not say it that way. There was a time where uh, I wanted to be the greatest musician. I was a professional musician. I was a music major. I want to be the greatest musician. But then I realized, well, I'm not exactly the best musician. Then I wanted to prove how smart I am, and I realized pretty quickly how much I don't know. See, I talked. To, I spoke several weeks ago at, at Journey Church on a Sunday morning about comparison. And when we compare ourselves, we usually do it in one of two ways. Typically, one way we do it is we look at ourselves and what we do not have and then compare ourselves to what others apparently do have. I look at someone and I think, man, if I could be as outgoing as him and make friends like he does, then I could do something really significant for the kingdom. Now, if you know me, I am an extrovert. Yes, I absolutely am. I'm an extrovert, but only in certain settings. I have to force myself at other times. I could think to myself, man, if I could only sing and play an instrument like Pastor Tony, our worship pastor, man, then I could make an impact. See, I look at what appears to be there, and I look at my, an area short in me, and I, I, I make that comparison. See, when we compare the weak areas of our lives with someone else's strengths, guess what happens? We always feel inferior. And so when we spoke about that back in August, we made the statement that comparison steals our joy. It steals our purpose. That was back in the Brainwave series. You want to go back and listen to that message. The other way we compare ourselves, though, is we compare what we have or what we're good at with what others are bad at or where they struggle. And that's just as bad. Because we'll look at somebody and say, man, if they had it all, you know, if they had it all together like I do, they wouldn't be in that boat. Or, you know what, if they would just not live like that, if they would make better choices. And so, you know, if they could get a good work ethic, if they could do this or whatever, they wouldn't be poor. They wouldn't be there. And we find ourselves in a place where we're comparing how good I am to how bad they are. Can I just say this? I believe comparison is one of the greatest downfalls of humanity. The truth is we do not set ourselves up by comparing ourselves against each other. We lose either way when we do that. But when we compare ourselves to Jesus, that's where we find out who we really, really are. He's our ruler. Can I just say this? Jesus should be our plumb line to know where we're level. Mark 9.35, and listen, this is a really big piece. Mark 9.35, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Now, Mark stresses the importance of, of the next saying with three different emphasis. Sitting down called the 12, and said. Sitting down, called the 12, and said. Why is that important? Because Jesus took the posture of a rabbi, and he called them to himself. What followed must have simply ha have thrown the disciples into even greater confusion. Because upside-down living is being a servant by putting other people first. And that's such a reversal of our worldly values. How important this principle is can be seen by its repetition in the tradition. What do I mean by that? Well, you'll see it in Mark 10, 31, again, 43 through 44. You'll see it in Matthew 23, 8 through 11. You'll see it in Luke 22, 24 through 27. The very, the very fact that the disciples were concerned about who was greatest underscores their failure to understand Jesus' statements about his suffering and about his death. The leadership style that the disciples were accustomed to was shown by the Pharisees and the, t and the teachers of the law. And Jesus addressed that in Matthew 23, 11. Look at this, Matthew 23, 1 through 4. Then Jesus said to his crowds, or uh, to the crowd and his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on each other's on, on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to help them move. Okay, so what is he saying? The te the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they hold a position of influence. Okay, they have this position, a place of influence. And Jesus said that respect was due. Okay, yes, that's there. But most of what was taught was by the scribes and the Pharisees, not because of their conduct, but because they sat in Moses' seat. That's important. Not their conduct, but because of the position. They sat in Moses' seat. The written word wasn't available like it is today. So Jews would go to the synagogue, and they would hear the Pharisees and the teachers of the law read the law from Moses' seat. 
the office of explaining that law among the Jews. It devolved and it fell to the scribes and the Pharisees. So in the synagogues, they sat while expounding the law, and then they rose up when they read it. By sitting in the seat of Moses, we're to understand authority to teach the law. Or as Moses taught the nation giving the law, so they taught by explaining it. So that's not the problem. The fault of the Pharisees is found in verse 3. They simply didn't practice what they taught. They taught servanthood. They taught all those things, but they didn't live it out. Upside down greatness isn't simply about position and proclamation. Most of you, you know, maybe you're a parent. I, I'm a parent. I've got three kids, 22, 19, and 16. And I found myself doing the very things that drove me nuts when I was a kid. Because I would tell my parents, or I'd tell my kids, do as I say, not as I do. Right? I'm the parent, you do what I say type of thing. And the problem is that is that we, we tend to follow what is seen rather than just what is heard. So they weren't following just what the Pharisees were teaching. They were following their example. And Jesus was warning against that. Go on into Matthew 23, verse 5. Everything they do is for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. Hear me, hear me when I say this. For the Pharisees, their leadership was based on popularity and appearance. Hello, celebrity Christians. Their phylacteries, their tassels, they were very, very long. That's from Deuteronomy eleven eighteen, and again, Numbers 15, 38. That piece is there. They were being obedient to the law, but their motivation for their religious practice was incorrect. It was done to promote an image that would receive the praise of man. And when we put ourselves in that boat, we're in trouble. Jesus goes on in verse 8. He says, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. See, I think it's important to understand the Pharisees loved the use, their, use of their titles. Jesus wasn't saying that in titles in and of themselves are wrong. No, if you'll listen carefully, I refer to our pastoral staff as pastor, Pastor Shelley, Pastor Blake, Pastor McCutcheon, Pastor Michael, Pastor Tony, Pastor Mariah. Why? Because there's an honor that goes along with that. I don't call them Tony or Blake, certainly not Pastor McCutcheon. I want you to understand that there's an honor piece that goes with it. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that in and of themselves, but when the heart loves and it collects, and it demands, and it cherishes the title, it's wrong. After Jesus has explained this leadership style of the Pharisees, showing that greatness and influence isn't built on position, or on popularity, or even proclamations or titles, he then shows what true greatness is. Look at this, verse 11. I love this. He says, the greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. A very common misconception among those who want to exercise leadership, uh, a leadership role over others, is that it comes with glory and power and positions of honor. And Jesus flips that whole thing on its head. He flips the whole concept upside down. Why? Because upside down living involves service that is rooted in sacrifice. What, 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 what does that mean? Look at this. Jesus the son of God, he had every right to, de to demand service and honor from others. Instead, he lowered himself to the lowest place possible to show how to lead. He was the bottom of the ladder. The key to the life of Jesus is that he came not to be served, but to be a servant. In that case, the deeper principle will be that that if we desire spiritual greatness, then we will, tr we will truly desire the task of serving others. And so we must deliberately choose the lowliest and the most humble place. Can I tell you, if serving is beneath you, then leadership is beyond you. If serving is beneath you, then leadership is beyond you. Because humili humility, it's not a natural virtue. And few qualities are more unpopular in our self-assertive world, right? Mark 9, 36 and 37. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking them in his arms, he said to him, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Here's the illustration in verse 35. Jesus took a child, possibly one from the family in whose house he was teaching. We don't know. 
And he first stood beside him in verse 36. But then Jesus took him in his arms. And while everybody was watching, Jesus started to speak. Why? Because a child was a person of no importance in that culture. It was subject to the, to, to the authority of the elders. A child was not taken seriously except as a responsibility. One to be looked after, not one to be looked up to. To turn and become like a child was a radical transformation, a radical reorientation from the mentality of that rat race idea to an acceptance of the insignificance. See, here's what I want you to understand. Upside down living entails caring about people. Insignificant people like children in this time because Jesus himself is concerned about them. Forgotten people in forgotten places. You want to know a great way to have an impact on, on people around you? Do you want to know how to really impact your home, your kids, your employees, or your employer? Follow Jesus. He's our example. The upside-down kingdom is about caring for those who seem insignificant and have no value to us. Upside-down living is this. You are more important than me. If we exalt, lift up ourselves, we will be humbled. But if we humble ourselves, we will be exalted. I suppose each of us has our own reasons for trying to exalt ourselves and show ourselves greatness. I, I think that's unfortunately kind of natural. But I wonder if the reason I try so hard to prove my worth is because I'm terrified that maybe on some level I don't have any value. On some level I'm insignificant or I'm unimportant or I'm just not enough. It's in the midst of this very struggle that Jesus enters the picture and he comes along and he shows us a new way. See, Jesus demonstrates that he is the one who gives true value. When we, when, when we come to him as a child, we receive that love and we learn that we are his and we are his beloved. That we are of infinite value and worth in his eyes. And because we are his and he loves us and he loves what he created. He loves us with a love that knows no limits. And this is the truth that he wants us to love and serve others with. When we live out our lives out of this love and this truth, we're finally able to understand what he means when he says the last will be first. Since our value and our worth are rooted in him and they're rooted in his immense love, we are then free to love others with the same love in which our, we ourselves are loved. We no longer have to work hard, so hard, at making ourselves worthy. We're no longer, we don't have to be consumed with ourselves anymore. We can actually make ourselves last in order to truly love others by making them first. We're free to evaluate them above ourselves instead of having to compare and to compete. Others are no longer a threat to our personal lives. We are now able to love freely like a child because we are loved as his child. That's true servant leadership in this upside down kingdom. So here's my question. As we get ready to, to kind of close this one out, where do you look to have your significance met? How do you try to make yourself feel valuable? What do you think it means to really find your identity in Jesus? I'm going to ask you maybe as soon as you turn this video off or the next couple of minutes, days, whatever that might look like, get a little with the Lord and start asking him, help me find my identity in you. And help me get to a place where I think of myself less and I'm all about other people more. To really walk out what you're asking me to walk out. Father, I thank you that you're an amazing God. I love God that you're, you're working in our hearts and lives and you're doing something amazing. Lord, I pray, God, that you would just continue to be with us. Let us look for ways to serve other people and be about other people. Lord, have your way in our hearts and lives. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Blessings on you guys. Thank